I hope that you enjoyed this next presentation by Susan Mulligan from the Cayaguas Water District. She's going to give her presentation specifically to the water resources used in Ventura County. Our water issues are very similar to the issues statewide. Water issues are water issues in California. And although I'll be talking about local ones, they're very similar all over the state. So we're going to talk about where our water comes from in this county, what's the problem, how we got in this mess, because undoubtedly we're in a mess now, and what the future holds. So where does our water come from? Well, there's local stormwater capture. There's water captured in Lake Casitas and captured in Lake Piru, and it's delivered for agricultural and municipal purposes after it's been captured in the wintertime. There's groundwater, some of which is recharged by that local stormwater. State project water, mostly for municipal uses, a little bit for uh, state pro or a little bit for agricultural uses, but mostly municipal. And recycled wastewater, which is more and more being used for agriculture these days. So let's talk about where the water comes from in the various parts of the county. In the West County, which was the first part of our county to develop, and there's no accident that it was, it's fairly rich in local supplies. They have Lake Casitas, groundwater, and some recycled water is being used as well. In the middle of the county, it's a combination of local and imported water. Agriculture is primarily using local groundwater. There is some imported water that comes into Lake Piru that supplies that area. The cities are using some imported water. And there's also recycled water being used. Thousand Oaks and Simi Valley, which were the last to develop, are virtually 100% dependent on imported water from the State Water Project. Our area doesn't get much water from Colorado River. Typically, we get none. Right now in the drought, we're getting a little bit, but it's not physically possible to get much to us. And some recycled water in those areas. So these are the groundwater basins in our county. There are some up in the Ojai area, all up and down the Santa Clara River Valley, out on the Oxnard Plain. You've got the Las Posas Valley, Pleasant Valley, and uh, there's some very small ones in Thousand Oaks and Simi that are so small they aren't even shown here. This shows how the, the uh, water is used by the different uh, interests. So out on the Oxnard Plain, about 70% is used by agriculture, about a third municipal. Up in the Las Posas Basins, you're looking at about 85% agriculture and some municipal. Pleasant Valley, 75%, same thing. So mostly agriculture is using our groundwater basins, but it's shared with municipal, which creates some challenges for managing things. So the state project water that comes to our area comes from Lake Oroville, through the Sacramento Delta, which was mentioned earlier, in, and that's in the Sacramento River, it gets to there. It's pumped out of the south end of the Delta, comes down through the California Aqueduct to Castaic Lake, to Pyramid Lake, and Castaic Lake. And here's how it gets into the county. You've got Pyramid Lake, and a fairly small amount of water, denoted by a small drop, goes into Lake Piru, where United releases it from there and recharges all the basins in the Santa Clara River Valley and also recharges uh, the Oxnard Plain and Pleasant Valley basins through some spreading basins over in the El Rio area. So that's how some state project water gets in. Another way state project water gets in that people aren't always aware of is that the Santa Clarita area uses state water project water off of Castaic Lake and they discharge a fairly high volume of water. It's well over 10,000 acre feet a year into the Santa Clara, Clara River as wastewater. Now, it has the unfortunate characteristic of being salty, but it is wet water. So that also comes, and the origin of that is the State Water Project. The last way it gets into our area is it gets treated at a plant in the San Fernando Valley, comes across the valley, and then into Simi Valley through my agency, Cayugas Municipal Water District, and gets delivered primarily to municipal folks out in um, 
Simi Valley, Thousand Oaks, all the way, really everywhere municipal south of the Santa Clara River. But what's another thing that people don't realize is that that water that comes in, that state project water that comes into the municipal folks, actually serves other purposes that ultimately help agriculture. And imported water comes in, the cities use it, some of it goes into the ground, some of it pours out of the groundwater basins that fill up out of Simi Valley, out of Thousand Oaks. If you've ever been back in Wildwood and seen that waterfall that comes down when you take the hike back there, that's water that's over irrigation that's just spilling out of Thousand Oaks. Simi Valley has similar issues. It gets treated in wastewater treatment plants. Some of that is discharged to creeks, and it too, most of our inland recycled water, highly treated wastewater, never makes it to the ocean. City of Ventura, City of Oxnard, theirs makes it to the ocean. The rest of it is all recharging groundwater basins or is being used directly by municipal or agricultural folks. That too recharges the basin. So we use our, our state project water over and over again, which is a good thing, but I'll tell you one of the problems with doing that. Here's where the wastewater plants are in our county. All but these two, Oxnard and Ventura, mainly recharge groundwater basins, or they're getting used directly as recycled water. OK, those are our supplies. What's the problem? Problem number one, we don't have enough water to meet all of our needs. Lake Oroville 2011, Shasta looks the same. 2014, looks about the same right now. This was November 2014. Same issue. Not good. These people, in order to get to the marina a year ago, had to rappel down the sides of Lake Oroville. Those are some determined fishermen. Lake Casitas, this is September, 44%. Lake Casitas was very well designed. It was designed for a 20-year hydrology, which is great. Most of our other lakes are for much shorter hydrologies. So they actually do quite well during long droughts. And they are doing pretty well. 44% doesn't sound good, but it's a heck of a lot better than most of the other reservoirs in this state, like this one. Like Pyre is at 13% of capacity. The ladies from The Bachelor went out there and said it was just a, I don't know if they would use the word hellhole, but it was something like that. It wasn't a very nice lake. For the first time since the LA Aqueduct was built in 1913, this year they got zero water from it. That's never happened before. Lake Mead. Lowest level since initial fill in the 1930s. These are all the supplies that come into Southern California. They're all having problems. And we'll talk about why in a minute. This is, some of you may recognize it, the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency. And the issue is everything that is yellow or red is below sea level, which isn't sustainable long term because the ocean's right here and will ultimately head inland if this isn't reversed as a general trend. So again, not enough water for these folks. Problem number two, and this gets back to our reuse of water, and also there are some of the problems in the delta. Our local aquifers are getting saltier. Groundwater is not suitable for irrigation in some cases. Dischargers, the wastewater plants who have groundwater sources, are violating regulatory standards for how salty the water is to discharge into creeks. And some local groundwater supplies, notably in Simi Valley and Thousand Oaks, aren't even being used because the water's so salty. And we miss out on the low salt stormwater recharge because some of our basins are so full of salty water that when it rains, the water just floats on top and goes out to the ocean. So we're missing out on some opportunities to catch good quality stormwater. This is the Las Posas Basin. We have Simi Valley over off to the right, discharging salty water. There's some salty sediments in the soil anyway. This is the creek. And you've got sort of grand zero of salinity here. And it's moving north 
into the deep aquifer. So these are chloride concentrations. You can see here you're up to 200. The native water's down really low, below 25. And this water's just moving, moving, moving north as there's pumping up here and as the salty water comes in. Like with the Santa Clara River, it's nice that water's coming in. It's not so good that it's salty. So it's a, it's a dilemma. Do you stop the water coming in? Do you deal with the salt? It's, it's a tricky issue. OK, so those are the problems. Not enough water. The water's salty, getting saltier. Well, how do we get into this mess? Some of you may have heard this quote from Mark Twain. Water's, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. Well, in the last year when there's been a drought, you hear a lot, there's a lot of finger pointing. And I'll show you some of the fingers that are being pointed. It's big business. She's drinking almonds. 368 glasses of water. It's the fault of the almond farmer. If we got rid of the almond trees, we'd all be fine. It's Nestle. They're making bottled water. What are they doing that in California during the drought? <laughs> Protests, picketing. It's fracking. Those frackers are using lots and lots of water, and they're just destroying California. You've probably seen, how many of you seen any of these in the paper? Yeah, yeah. So these are, these are the easy you know, one-liners that people use about what the problem is. OK, it's residential homes. Camarillo City Council's in big uproar because they've approved developments. They're getting built by the freeway where everybody can see them. They're asking people to cut back, and they are having you know, people on both sides of the issue showing up at city council meetings. You see stuff like that, and people get upset, and they rat out their neighbors. And then you've got Kanye and Kim and other celebrities using lots and lots of water. You know, they, they get in the newspaper. Actually, Kanye and Kim, they buy from an agency just next to ours. And apparently, once they learned that there was a water shortage, um, they did start conserving. <laughs> it's the regulators. If it wasn't for the smelt, we'd be fine. You see these in the Central Valley? Boxer, Costa, Pelosi. All this Endangered Species Act stuff. Those folks aren't helping us, but you know who started all of this? Does anybody know? Mm -hmm. One of our Republican pre presidents. Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, Endangered Species Act, they sounded so good back then. Clean up the air, clean up the water, protect the polar bears. But it's just gone so far. And these laws are in, on the books. And as the previous speaker said, we're not going to change them. But it, it, it's that. So that is one issue. And does anybody know who Scientific American thinks is the problem? This was an article in Scientific American about the problem and who's causing water problems in the state. You remember this movie? <laughs> You remember that? No, no, I mean, it's happening now in my canyon. It's happening in your canyon? In my canyon. It's part of the problem. And these aren't all wrong, but these are sort of the headlines. There's some systemic problems that are really the issue. So seriously, how do we get in this mess? I'm going to talk about these issues. The sunshine, a dead fish, a lot of people, the hanging gardens of Babylon, and a pile of dead sheep. So let's go into what the real issues are. Well, it, it hasn't rained much. This is statewide precipitation through 2014. 2015 is just as bad. This is the historical trend, and there's 2014, with, again, 2015 being just about as bad. We have had three weather, weather record breakers. It's hard to say. 2013 was the driest year. 2014 was the hottest year on record. And 2015 was the lowest snowpack on record. And the other years were pretty high in these other categories. So it's been a rough three years statewide. But it isn't just the weather. We have some systemic problems that have made the drought worse, made the water shortage worse, really, not necessarily just a drought. So let's talk about the dead fish. 
We built our projects back 50, even 100 years ago, before the Endangered Species Act. And although there are other things that have caused fish, fish populations to decline, diverting water from the creeks is part of the problem. And we need to divert less water. The Endangered Species Act said so, and that's the way it is, and we can rail and complain, but we can't change that. So we need to accept that as a fact. The delta, this was talked about briefly, this isn't a local issue, but it really affects our local supplies. Our water comes through the Sacramento Delta. Fresh water, it gets pumped out to the state project and the Central Valley project through pumps at the south end. These folks benefit from the fresh water that's being pulled south, and that is a point of contention. It makes it tough for the Farm Bureau to you know, de deal with this issue because these are agricultural folks. And these are partly about half municipal, half agricultural, and these are all agricultural. But the water is coming through in a way that doesn't work because the seawater comes in and you've got quality issues and you've got fish swimming around in here and it's a problem. There's 750 various species, 40 of them threatened or endangered. Pumping water out of the south end of the delta has just been a nightmare for about the last 10 years. We keep getting the pumps shut off, state project and Central Valley project. The stressors, as mentioned by the previous speaker, is ammonia being discharged from wastewater plants? Habitat replaced by agriculture? Um, I, I think it's a fact. I, I would consider it a fact that it used to be a big marsh, and all the little smelt and all the baby salmon could hide in the grasses so that they didn't get eaten by things as they made their way through the delta. Now there's no place for them to hide. You've got food for them declining. You've got striped bass which the fishermen love to keep in the delta, and they're very good at lobbying to keep the striped bass in the delta, but they're not native, and they eat the smelt, and they eat the baby salmon. So when they count only two smelt, and we have to cut off pumps, you know, probably the bass are eating more than our pumps are. So I have a few opinions on this. Um, natural flows, it used to be 150 years ago that water came down the Sacramento River and went out through the San Francisco Bay came up the San Joaquin River, flowed out through the San Francisco Bay. All the native stuff was used to the water flowing this way. Now here's how it flows. Comes down the Sacramento River, comes up the San Joaquin River, but a lot of it, a lot goes to the ocean, but a lot of it goes to the pumps down at the South Delta. That's not natural, that's tough for the fish. So Judge Wanger, this was mentioned. These are the allocations on the state project. Central Valley similar. 100% means you get all the water you contracted for. Back starting in 68, everybody was getting lots of water. Judge Wanger decision. This is a 10-year rolling average. Look how much we've lost, how much water we've lost. That's entirely related to endangered species issues. Total lost in five years since 2010, almost 5 million acre feet. United Water Conservation District has very similar issues out on the Santa Clara River. These agencies filed a complaint with the State Water Resources Control Board saying that United should stop diversions from the river to recharge the Oxnard Plain, Pleasant Valley basins and deliver water to agriculture on the basins because it harms endangered species, steelhead in this case, and people's use of the river for kayaking, other recreational uses. This is still pending. This is still out there. Casitas, same thing in our local area. This is on the Ventura River. Casitas got in a big fight over endangered species issues. They actually tried to take on the federal government. They didn't win. So what they have to do, and what this all means is, you have to keep releasing water down rivers and not keep it behind the dams, and it doesn't end up going to municipal or agricultural uses because it's going down the creeks to protect the fish. Okay, big pile of stinky sheep. Let's talk about this problem. Ruin is the destination towards which all men rush, each pursuing his own best interests in a society that believes in freedom of the commons. 
Freedom in a commons brings ruin to all. This is the tragedy of the commons issue. And the concept is you have a field and it's free for everybody to put their sheep out on it. You've got a bunch of people who raise sheep. It's nice, there's lots of grass. But each individual who owns the sheep is incentivized to put as many sheep on there as possible because it's free and there's no limits on using it. And you end up with a big pile of dead sheep. This comes into play with our aquifers. We've had pretty limited management. Our, our management in our aquifers has not been tied to the yield of the aquifers. And it's resulted in some overpumping in our aquifers. And that's simply a tragedy of the commons. Everybody has an incentive to pump as much as they possibly can because that's their own economic benefit. But if you get too many people doing it, everybody suffers. And statewide we've had that issue, and locally we've had that issue. And now things are gonna need to change. The St Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is changing those things. So everybody's gonna probably have to pump less. This is Central Valley, and you've got it's really just a color image of loss of groundwater over a 12-year period. It's the same issue. Everybody individually should be, or they wouldn't be a good businessman, pumping as much as possible, but it hurts the whole. Okay, let's talk about the gardens of Babylon. Well, back in ancient times, the Fertile Crescent was a very active and prolific agricultural area. Today, you look at the... Uh, footage of Iraq on TV, it isn't anymore. And what brought this to an end actually wasn't drought or war, it was salt. If you bring in irrigation water in a dry area and you keep irrigating, salt builds up over time. And we're in an arid area here and also in many parts of California. When we irrigate, the water doesn't go anywhere. It just stays and the salt builds up. I'm sure you're familiar here with that concept. So here's how it builds up in groundwater basins. You've got some naturally occurring salts. You have imported water coming in and it gets applied and you get some evaporation but the salts get built up. You run it through wastewater plants. As water goes through wastewater plants and through people's homes it picks up salt there too. That recharges our basins. And what happens is a lot of the water never makes it to the ocean, and the salts don't make it to the ocean, and they build up and build up and build up. You've heard, I think, some of this issue in the Central Valley. It's happening in our area as well. So just from the state project water from Cayegas through Simi Valley, 100 tons of salt come into the service area every day. And as I told you, the wastewater never makes it to the ocean. Well, neither do the salts. So that's how many, much salt is coming in every single day. And most is ending up in our groundwater basins. Okay, people. California population's increased by almost four times since 1950 through 2010. You've got population growth in Nevada and Arizona. Those are also competing for our water supplies. So all this I've been talking about, where we've got our supplies getting reduced because of needing to do groundwater management, because of endangered species, you've got more people competing for less water. So what's in the future based on all of this? We're going to have to change. I'm just going to go through these and talk about them a little bit more. Groundwater pumping regulation, going to have increased regulation of use efficiency, more creative and extensive use of wastewater, more small-scale stormwater capture, increased treatment and use of poor quality groundwater. As John Grether said earlier, I think more water leasing and transfers statewide and locally. And maybe the seawater desal. Pretty costly, but that might be out there. So talk about the deltas. Proposed fix to maybe be able to get more reliable supplies so we don't keep getting cut off by getting fish in at the south end of the delta, building tunnels underneath the delta. There's gonna to need to be changes in things like fish ladders. And in the old days, they looked like this. Something more natural 
is going to need to be required. The fish aren't all that attracted to jump over these. And this all costs money. United's going to have to do something, not necessarily this design, but something more natural and much more expensive to get fish over the Freeman Diversion. And believe it or not, maybe even over the dam at Lake Payeru. So as a result, water users are going to end up paying more, agricultural and urban, to build and maintain habitat protection measures like that and like the tunnels. And there's going to be less water available because some flow is going to need to be left in the waterways. And we're going to have to deal with that issue. There's going to be increased regulation in this state of water use efficiency. It's already come down on the urban folks. The state in this drought took a very draconian measure, went and looked at how much gallons per capita per day was being used in certain areas. They didn't care if you had developed your own local supplies. They didn't care about anything. You're cutting or you're getting fined. And these cities this past year have had to cut back these areas by these percentages or face some st stiff fines from the state. That's never happened before. They're also doing some mandatory use restrictions. This all coming from the state during this drought. I expect these are going to stay in place. I don't think the state's going to lift these. They put a landscape ordinance in place saying that new homes have to have efficient landscaping. This too came from the state. They're about to have tougher showerhead requirements. So if you build a new house and you want to put in all those ones that come in from everywhere, you better hurry up before this regulation kicks in. New buzzwords, non-functional turf. If the only person who walks on the turf is the person who mows it, remove it. The state is also getting pretty draconian about that. They're fine with turf that people, kids play on, but this kind of turf that people are just looking at, whatever you think about that, the state has an opinion, and their opinion is, and the governor's opinion is, that's a waste. And, and he has said that with respect to agriculture in this drought. When people complain, I don't want my turf removed, he says, what's more important, your turf that nobody ever plays on? or agriculture in our state. And, and I think that's a good judgment. But there are some trends for regulating agriculture as well. Mandatory metering. Here, the GMA already requires metering. Um, water management plans, currently for water suppliers with more than 25,000 irrigated acres. These are new things, new plans that need to be put together involving accounting for water and efficiency. And then you're all familiar with recent changes for best management practices for discharge. So urban is being regulated first, but agriculture, they'll get there, I think, in this state towards agriculture. Regulation of groundwater pumping. I'm sure you're all familiar with SIGMA, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act adopted last year. The, the agencies need to be formed by 2017. Plans need to be adopted for the most critical overdrafted basins. I'll get into our area which ones those are by 2020. And they need to achieve sustainability by 2040. It sounds like a long time, but it's a tough process to go from where we are today, particularly places like the Central Valley, which don't even have a GMA, to really regulating and managing groundwater pumping in a fair way. So these are our basins. The DWR ranking of our basins is the critically overdrafted ones are Oxnard and Pleasant Valley. Low priority are Simi and Conejo. They're currently too salty for anybody to use anyway. And all the others are medium priority in our area. The Ojai Basin is managed by a groundwater management agency created in 1991. And they're actually doing pretty well in terms of this is a water level chart since they were formed in 1990. And they're managing things pretty well. It's gone down during the drought, but you would expect that. Santa Paula Basin was adjudicated in 1996. It's, run, it's uh, monitored by a technical advisory panel of United, Ventura, and the Santa Paula Basin's Pumpers Association. 
There's some dispute between United and Ventura about whether this, the allocations are too much for what the basin can sustain. United is saying that the water levels are dropping and that there need to be cutbacks. Ventura, who is the first one to be kicked out of the basin if the water levels are dropping, dropping has a different opinion. So stay tuned for the future on that one. Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency. This is the big, big gorilla, big gorilla is not a good word, big agency in our area, covers Oxnard, Port Wenimi, Camarillo, Moore Park, most of the basins in our area that are the big producers. Was it just last year they adopted Emergency Ordinance E, cutting back pumping for municipal and for agriculture. It was painful for everybody. It's in place. No new wells. Lots of other things in there. No pumping stored water and cutbacks, 20%. They are also the agency in that area that will be the Sustainable Groundwater Management Agency. They were written up as such in the law, and they are now working on a SIGMA plan to get those basins to sustainability. It is a complex process. They have a technical advisory group helping the staff review um, a plan that's going to be written by a consultant to try to figure out safe yield, figure out allocations, and get agreement on what the hydrogeology looks like. That, too, is going to be a very controversial and difficult process. They also have additional powers under Sigma. It used to be that Fox Canyon GMA had the ability to um, fine people or charge them extra water, extra money if they pumped too much. Now they actually have the authority under the law, once they adopt their plan, to charge a fee for pumping in order to build projects to uh, bring additional supplies into the basin, which is interesting because United Water Conservation District also has that authority. So there's some overlapping authorities, and it will be interesting to see how all that sorts itself out. Now, in our area, there are areas that aren't covered by either of the two GMAs in our area. One is up in the Ojai area, the Ventura Mound Basin, Fillmore and Piru, and the Santa Rosa Basin. And the interesting thing here is, who's going to be the sigma? You have some uh, various agencies wanting to all be the sigmas. Santa Rosa Basin, for example, Camarosa Water District put in to do it. They cover the whole basin. County of Ventura, now this isn't GMA, it's County of Ventura, said they should do it. Cam City of Camarillo came in and said, well, we want to do it. So now all three of them have applications up at state, and they're going to need to figure out who's really doing it. Uh, you're going to have other kinds of joint groups that are doing it in these other areas. So the good news is it'll create opportunities. If we can sustainably manage our basins, we may get some rules for storage so that you don't have an emergency ordinance east situation where you get into a drought and you don't have surface water supplies and you're also prohibited from pumping groundwater. If we can have sustainable basins, we might be able to store water when we have more water in the wet years and be able to be reliably getting it out in the dry years, Conju which is conjunctive use. Again, if you have a managed basin and you all know the ground rules, it opens up opportunities for a water market, which theoretically should make the water go where it can be most effectively used. We're going to have increased treatment and use of poor quality groundwater. You've got LADWP. It wasn't cost effective before. The San Fernando Basin's full of chemicals, but they are moving forward to do cleanup on that and actually use that basin again. In our area, we have the salinity management pipeline, which is a big brine line that's being built by my agency. It's constructed all the way to North Camarillo. It's in construction, getting to the Las Posas Basin, and we've got some future construction in Las Posas Basin and also in the Santa Rosa Basin all the way to Simi. What this does is it ma makes it possible for agricultural and municipal entities to use brackish groundwater, clean it up, and have a place to put the brine because you're not allowed to discharge it to sewers or local creeks. And what we seem to be finding is that although it does cost 
agricultural mo agriculture more to treat that water than to just pump it, it's still a whole lot less than buying imported water from us. Uh, for the municipal folks, it's also, they treat to a slightly different standard. It's more expensive for them, but that too is still less expensive than buying water, imported water from us. So you will see desalters going in. This one's already in place. These are under consideration, all these Pleasant Valley, uh, Somos ones, uh, excuse me, uh, Las Posas ones. Some of these Santa Rosa ones are also uh, being planned. You're going to see some more small scale stormwater capture. I, I think this is more politically beneficial than really producing water, but it's going to happen and various entities are pushing for this, where you have cre creeks, dry creeks catching water and you have medians that are catching water. You've got the government center, they've put permeable concrete near the curb and gutters to capture stormwater. Potentially retention of storm flows to enhance groundwater recharge. This is something that's being discussed in the Las Posas Basin. If we can get some of the salty groundwater out of there, it might be possible to put rubber dams in the creek and capture some storm water without a big expense, just hold it in the creek, let the storm pass, and be able to recharge a little bit more water. This is Village at the Park, Pleasant Valley Road. They've got big, if you drive by there, big basins where they're capturing stormwater as well. Almost through here. That's not as easy as it sounds in our county. You know, a lot of people think that's the panacea, just catch more water. Well, it's not that easy. Those places have rising groundwater. Those are the only areas where you really have opportunities for recharge in our county, along the riverbeds and a few other places. So it's not that easy, and in outcrops of aquifers. You can't just do it anywhere and have it help the groundwater basins. We're going to have more extensive and creative use of wastewater. It used to be cities went to a wastewater plant, to the creek. Maybe they diverted it to the cities, maybe to farms. Sometimes it went directly to those uses. Now what we're going to see is that the wastewater is going to be highly treated like Oxnard's doing now. It'll go to spreading basins into the aquifers, pumped and used by cities or by agriculture. And I'll give you some examples. People are making their recycled water systems bigger. Oxnard is treating to an extremely high level and attempting to get that water to farmers out on the Oxnard Plain fighting through regulations and, and uh, lawsuits, and hopefully it'll happen in the next few months that some of that water is going to get to the, the growers on the Oxnard Plain. This is a project that was built about 15 years ago. It takes water from Thousand Oaks Hill Canyon plant. It comes down the creek. It gets diverted just by the freeway at the bottom of the grade goes into some pipelines, delivers to customers of Camarosa Water District, and gets delivered to Pleasant Valley County Water District, and that's all municipal wastewater coming from the city of Thousand Oaks. You're going to see aquifer recharge with recycled wastewater. City of San Diego is actually looking at taking wastewater, putting it in, I'm going to move this forward, putting it in a lake that feeds one of their drinking water treatment plants and sending it straight to their customers. And the state is loosening up on the rules for this sort of thing. City of Ventura, same thing. They're looking to treat their wastewater, put it straight into the pipes to the people in the city of Ventura. More water leasing and transfers, metropolitan water districts buying farmland in Blythe. They have agreed to keep a certain percentage during droughts in farming but they are also going to be fallowing land in order to provide water during droughts to agricultural folks. Las Posas Basin is working on a market proposal in their allocation plan. And finally, the seawater desal. The urban folks are starting to look at that. San Diego's Carlsbad plant is about to get up and running. It's a very big plant. But the challenges are it uses a lot of energy, so the environmental folks are not in favor of it. The projects really need to use renewable supplies like solar, which are more expensive. There's concerns about marine life impingement on intakes, taking in zooplankton and baby fish. So the permit agencies are making entities go 
a subsurface with their intakes, which is incredibly expensive. And finally, cost. It's about three times what municipal folks are paying for water now to do seawater desal. So what to make of all of this? This has been kind of a quick tour through lots of water issues. Less water is going to be available from traditional supplies. Between the Endangered Species Act, between more of us in the Southwest competing for less water, between, and Sigma, there's going to be less water available. We're going to need to develop new sources of water, and hopefully urban and agriculture can work together to do that. And we all are going to need to look carefully to better manage, reuse, and conserve the less water that we're going to end up having. That's it. I'll take any questions. I know that was a little depressing. <laughs> OK, yes? Is the, so the first question is, are there regulations coming out on um, home water softeners? I haven't heard about any in this county. People have talked about doing it, but nobody has done it in this county. The municipal folks would like to go ahead and have less salty water coming to their customers so that the customers don't want to have home water softeners. It's a heck of a thing to try to regulate. And then is there concern that so much salt would come out the brine line that we'd be in trouble? You mean with the regulators? Eventually? We don't think so, because that water that's coming out as brine and going into the ocean is still about one-tenth as salty as the ocean. So we think from a regulatory standpoint, we're not going to have a problem. Anything else? OK, thank you.